You might remember that last week we actually skipped a chapter, chapter in 1 Corinthians. We went to 1 Corinthians 13 because we wanted to talk about love before we talked about spiritual gifts. And chapters 12 and 14 highlight spiritual gifts. So that's where we're going today. And we're going to talk about the gift, uh, the God who keeps on giving. And in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in the first verse, it says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's a really insightful passage to what we're learning today. I'll come back to it in a minute. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, mir miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. What I'd like us to know this morning, this is the thought I'd like you to kind of allow everything else I say to filter through, and the thing I'd like you to carry out of here today, and that is you are not defined by what you get. You are defined by what you give. You're not defined by what you achieve, what you accomplish, or what you require. We are defined by what we give. When Paul wrote this letter to believers who in the ancient world lived in Corinth, uh, he understood they had some challenges unique to their culture. Uh, they were obsessed with status. It was the most important thing to them. They actually had ranking systems to determine how important a believer was, and that would determine where you sat. In fact, it would determine whether you were allowed in the same room. Some believers in the Corinthian culture had to stand outside and watch through the windows, not because there wasn't room for them, but because they didn't measure up. Additionally, the Corinthians had this insistence that some spiritual gifts were actually more valuable and important than other spiritual gifts, and they had a craving and addiction to those gifts that actually made them look better. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture, there's a bunch of gifts that are listed there, and what I want you to know is this is not an exhaustive list. Paul is not saying these are the only gifts that exist. Romans chapter 12 gives us another list of gifts. Uh, Ephesians 4 gives us another list of gifts. But what he wants us to know is that all of these gifts are actually grace gifts. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them. We didn't work to accomplish them. And so we have to understand they are pure grace gifts gifts. This is very important because uh, in, in religious culture, when one person seems to get a gift that we desire and we don't get it, we begin to ask ourselves if I need to work harder or be holier or if I need to do more in order to also get something from God. Why did he heal that person and not me? And so we turn it into a works-based and an accomplishment, achievement, value system that Paul is warring against in his language. He's trying to overthrow that aspect of their culture, and we need to overthrow our aspect of that as well. Now, you might say, well, we're not like that at all, but we are. I will tell you it is incredibly rare for anyone to receive any gift just out of grace. Almost all of our gifts are based on accomplishment. For example, on Christmas, Christmas, you get, good, you get gifts not if you are naughty, but if you are nice. Has anybody ever heard that? After Thanksgiving in our house, 
if our kids were misbehaving, I would say to them, poof. And they would say, what is that? And I would say, that is the sound of one of your Christmas gifts disappearing. <laughs> you should behave. You're running low on gifts right now. Christmas gifts. Graduation gifts. Why do we give graduation gifts? Because somebody accomplished, they achieved some completion of an expectation academically. Even wedding, we don't just give gifts to singles. No, you have to make a lifetime commitment to somebody and then you get your toaster. And birthday, <laughs> birthday, then you get birthday. If you make it another year, if you're a month shy, you're not getting your gift. See, gifts in our society are actually evidence that you have accomplished something or achieved something. And here's the problem with that concept. When we think like that, we start feeling entitled. And entitled adds something to us we don't want and takes something from us we do want. It takes away gratitude and it adds resentment. If your life isn't overflowing with gratitude, it could be that you've bought into the model of our culture that says gifts are deserved. And if you're filled with resentment, it could be that you've bought into the model of our culture that says if you don't get what you deserve, you have a right to be angry about it. And in our culture, we even think we have the right to decide what gifts we want. We make wish lists. We've got registries. And if someone gives you something you don't want, you can take it back and exchange it for what you do want. Or you can rewrap it and give it to somebody else <laughs> who is not likely to want it either. <laughs> so what is God's view of spiritual gifts? Well, he wants us to know that, first of all, your very identity is a gift. Your identity is a gift. I don't know if you noticed, but Paul said, no one can say by, this, by uh, speaking by the Spirit of God that Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. You know, we take a lot of pride in the worldview that we have come to accept, and we assume that we got there by the use of our minds. And you have to understand, Paul wants us to use our minds. He wants us to ask good questions. He wants us to wrestle our doubts and our fears. He just doesn't want us to think that that activity is the same as accomplishing something. That our ability to realize that God has given to us an incredible gift in the life of his son. And that if we're willing to trust that, it changes our eternal destiny. If we're willing to believe that, what God and Paul are telling us is, that was not something you earned. That is not something you deserve. That was a gift. Say, well, I did a lot of study, and I, I came down on the, the side of Christianity. Well, I'm glad you studied, but what made you interested to study to begin with? How did the information you were interested in happen to cross your path? How were you able to comprehend it? Why were you not interested in just ignoring it? All of that was the work of the Spirit in your life. If you belong to the family of God, your identity is a gift. But he doesn't stop there. He also tells us that our ability is a gift. Have you ever noticed that some people just have some abilities that other people do not have? For example, I have no mechanical ability. None. If you ever see me under the hood of a car, for the sake of the car, <laughs> intervene and get me out of there. I can take things apart. I just have no ability to put them back together again. And have you ever noticed that some people seem to have musical abilities and artistic abilities, and some of us do not have those abilities? And it doesn't matter. You can practice and practice and practice and practice, and if your voice is bad, it might get better, but that's not the same thing as saying it will get good. It's just what's true, isn't it? So how did you get that? How did you get a gift, a, a capacity, an ability that you may have developed, but you didn't create? And the answer is, is that that was a gift from God. He embedded that into your life, and he wants you to develop it 
but it is still a gift. And then he surprises us with this concept, and that is every single person has been given a spiritual gift so they can share it with others. And you might be sitting here and going, yeah, that's probably true of a lot of people, but not me. I don't have any spiritual gifts. And what I want you to know is you are not the exception to the rule. Paul did not say most people have spiritual gifts. He says the Holy Spirit makes it his responsibility to make sure that at least one gift of grace has been deposited into your life so that you have something to share with others so they will be enriched by what God is releasing through you. That's what he's saying. You are not the exception. And if we don't release it, we actually deprive others of the grace of God. So what do spiritual gifts look like? And uh, it's real easy to focus on the supernatural qualities of these gifts and not recognize the, the arenas of these gifts, the areas of these gifts, because the areas themselves are incredibly common. For example, the first group of gifts I want to mention to you are things that you know. Gifts where you know something. For example, wisdom. Wisdom is knowing a strategy, knowing how to get from here to where you need to be, what steps need to be taken, what strategy, what plan. How do you get from here to there? That's wisdom. It's knowing what to do. And how about knowledge? Knowledge is information you need not only to make a decision, but to help take those steps. And there are some examples of this in Scripture that are both natural knowledge and supernatural knowledge. For example, Peter was leading the church in Jerusalem, and there were two people, they were a husband and wife team, and they came in and they were pretending to be very generous with an offering that they were, they wanted everyone's attention about how generous they were, but they were pretending. They weren't giving nearly as much as they were pretending to. And the Holy Spirit just kind of gifted Peter with that piece of information, and he challenged them with it. Or how about uh, an evangelist by the name of Philip who was traveling on a road and has a, 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 what appears to be a serendipitous conversation with an Ethiopian who happens to be reading a passage from the Bible. And God actually helps Philip, the evangelist, know what to say in that moment. See, we think that we can just figure it all out before we get there. But to trust that God can actually help us know what to say, that's in that arena of a spiritual gift is things that we know. And then there's discernment. Discernment is seeing what is the motive. That's what something is the source of something. Or the agenda. What's the outcome of something. And it's very important, especially in, in communities that are faith-based, that our motives are good and our agenda is not hidden. Then there's another whole group of gifts that are things that we say things that we say. And so the example that he uses there is prophecy. And prophecy is the ability to share what God desires to happen. There's something that he would like to work out in the life of an individual or community. And so he'll begin to foretell what's possible if people will submit their ways to him. Or he may see something that's coming that he wants to spare people from, and he will warn them about that. What you need to know about all of these words, Paul is really critically clear in 1 Corinthians 14 that these words will always do three things. They will always pour courage into you, enabling you to act instead of fear into you, keeping you from acting. The second thing that they will do is they will build you up so that you can become what God intended rather than tearing you down to believe that you are worthless. And lastly, it will comfort you with the understanding that God has a purpose for your life and a plan to see it fulfilled in you. There is always those elements when this speech gift of prophecy is being given. Then the, he also talks about tongues, which is interesting. We know this story from the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit enabled people who didn't learn languages to speak languages they never learned. He just gave them the words to say. And when they said those words, it communicated some powerful things about God to others who did understand what they were saying. 
And I know that in, and I wish I could take more time on this today, I know that in, in Christianity there are different streams, some who say that that's no longer a possibility today, and other people who say that it is a possibility today. And in case you're wondering where we are in that, we think that all of the gifts of God are still available for us today, that he hasn't put some on the shelf and said uh, that's no longer available. We think he works all of them. But what is the purpose of tongues? The, the purpose of tongues is it helps you pray beyond what you personally know, and it actually builds you up. And then the interpretation of tongues actually takes those words that you may not know and allows everyone in the room to be built up. It's not just a personal experience then, it's a corporate or community experience. And then there are the, the, arena, the arena of things that we do, things that we do. And this he puts the category of miracles. Miracles are something that would not have happened or would not have happened at this time without God's supernatural intervention. And here's the thing about miracles. When God does miracles, he's not just doing it to show off. You know, just look at the life of Jesus. He never does a miracle to prove anything to anybody. He does miracles to reveal things about his heavenly father. And so it helps people understand God better, and it helps us share our faith. And then the supernatural capacity for faith, that is this this overwhelming sense of trust and confidence that empowers you and frees you to be able to take steps that you might have been paralyzed to take before. You are just no longer controlled by fear of failure or the concept of risk. The opportunity seems so much greater than anything you could lose. You're willing to take those steps. And then gifts of healing. Gifts of healing are recovering from an illness or relief from pain or reversing disease. And what's fascinating with almost all these gifts, they're often activated by something called prayer, our conversations with God. Now, why are these gifts so important? Because when we give a spiritual gift, what we're actually saying is that Jesus is Lord over every dimension of life. Our thought life, our speech life, and our action life. That there is no part of our life that can't come under the incredible grace of God or the gifts that he chooses to flow through us. Now, you might be sitting here once again and going, yeah, I'm not so sure I know what my gifts are. And I, I just want to give you a, a couple things that might help you here. One is you can go to ourcalvary.org slash serve, and it will show you ways that you can use your gifts to, in, a, in, a, in a faith community to make a difference in others' lives. And then ourcalvary.org slash gifts, that's actually an assessment that you can take online. Uh, and you complete it, and it will identify some gifts that maybe you have you didn't know that you had. And our goal is to help you discover what it is that God has invested in you. It's also great to ask yourself, what are you interested in or passionate about? Because God often puts passion and interest in alignment with a gift that he's given to us because he knows the continual releasing of that gift will often fatigue us and we need passion to keep us going through those times. So let's not withhold the gifts of God and restrict the grace of God that could be going to other people. You see, God himself is a giver by nature. I know you think, a lot of people think, that God is a taker. And, and we, we use language like this. When, when, a, when a horrific event occurs and, and a, a tornado comes in or an earthquake occurs, even in our country we call that an act of an act of God, as though God is just up in heaven and going, you know, I just got too many tornadoes laying around here. I'm going to release one and just kind of pick a place. And then we even assume horrible things, like if God picks a place, they must be worse than the rest of us. And, and Jesus had some very strong things to say about that. But uh, the, the concept here is that he's a giver by nature. Even people will say this. If they lose a loved one unexpectedly or by accident, they will say that God took them from me. C can I tell you something? You will never hear me say it because I don't believe it. I don't believe God takes. I believe God gives. And so what I say is not that God took them, but God did receive them when their time came. He welcomed them into his presence. 
Now, I know there are people who say, well, the Bible says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The guy who said that in Scripture was not trying to establish doctrine. He was trying to survive a hard time and understand what was going on in his life. God never intended that to be a doctrinal statement, and we shouldn't build one off of it. God is a giver by nature. He's the one who's given to us his son. He's the one who sent to us his son who was willing to give his life so that we could be part of his forever family. And by the way, Jesus accomplished and achieved what we could never accomplish and what we could never achieve. And then he turns around and gives it to us as a gift because he wants to overthrow the culture of achievement. And the Holy Spirit, he starts with the gift of grace that helps us understand that we are God's children, but then he continues to flow perpetually gifts of grace through our life so that others can discover that as well. And when we do that, when that culture of achievement is overthrown, it promotes humility among us. We do not earn what we have. We do not deserve what we have. God has been gracious to us. Now, when spiritual gifts are used in ways that others understand, order invades chaos. Order invades chaos. Look at this uh, passage of scripture. He says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and what's the next word? Inquirers or what's the next word? Unbelievers. Now this is fascinating to me because Paul is actually asking them to regulate how they release spiritual gifts based on the fact that there could be inquirers or unbelievers among you. Now, I know there are some people who believe that that should never happen. There should never be a regulation of a spiritual gift, and to ever do so is somehow quenching the spirit. But Paul actually says something quite different, and he says, if they come in, will they not think that you are out of your mind? By the way, this is one of the gifts the Corinthians love. They love speaking in tongues. And they would all get together, and they would all speak in tongues. And you would come in, and you wouldn't know one thing that they're saying. And then a person might even stand up in front of the room and just speak in tongues. And Paul actually writes in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, you are giving an amazing blessing, but nobody even knows when to say amen because they have no idea what you're saying. He said, they will think that you are out of your mind. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin. They are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Paul insists that the release of any spiritual gift in a corporate gathering is for the purpose of being able to be understood. And please hear what I'm about to tell you. Every time, every time we see confusion or disorder, in a community of faith, every time we see com uh, confusion or disorder in a community of faith, it is because a spiritual gift is either being withheld or misused. Every time. Something is not being released that should be, or something is being released in a way that people do not understand what is happening. And Paul says, we have to invade chaos with the divine order that God brings into those situations. And here's something else that's worth noting. And that is, if you misuse a spiritual gift, God does not take it away from you, but it does become ineffective in its release. It just doesn't accomplish what could have been. And so Paul says that when we use these gifts correctly, Order in, in, invades chaos, and he also tells us that humility invades pride. We recognize we don't really have anything to brag about. All we have is a gift that we're willing to share. Instead of calling attention to ourselves, we can point to the one who has been so generous with us. That's what God intends in spiritual gifts. Let's bow our heads this morning.
I think the first thing I would like to um, encourage you in is, is you might feel like you don't have anything to offer, and you do. Um, I don't claim to have a, a magic set of glasses or a capacity to know what that is for every person. But I have learned in the course of my life that God is completely trustworthy. And if he says he has something that he wants to flow through your life to make a difference in someone else's, then he does. And if you don't know what it is, I think it's worthwhile spending some time and energy trying to discover what that is. I know our culture says you can be anything you want to be. And that's not what God says. God says you can be anything you were created to be. And you can give anything that he's given you. So Father, help us today. Help us not settle for just being the receivers of others' gifts. We're grateful for that. Our lives have been transformed because of it. But there are other lives to yet be transformed through the gifts that you would release through us. Would you help us diligently discover what they are? Would you help us find ways to develop them in ways that allow others to understand your grace in their lives? And will you release them in ways that cause others to realize how good a God and giving a God you really are? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.